morning, we lost Gordon Banks, probably the best goalkeeper this country's ever seen. He was in the famous England team of 1966 when England were champions of the world. Four years later, he made arguably the greatest save of all time against the greatest player of all time, Pele. The BBC's Nigel Johnson has had a look back at the life of Gordon Banks. We have here one of the best goalkeepers in the world. We missed him when we went to Mexico, went to Mexico in 17. There's no way the Germans would have beat us that day. He's just a man with a great, quiet, positive attitude, and he's just a good man. Many goalkeepers are talked about as greats, Lev Yashin, Dino Zoff among them. But for many, Gordon Banks is the greatest, including teammate George Easton. Where will Gordon be remembered in, in the history of all the greats, do you reckon? No, no, he is, he is the greatest. Eastham spent seven seasons playing alongside Gordon for Stoke City and was also his teammate at the 1966 World Cup as England won the Jules Rimet Trophy. Also in that team was Jack Charlton, the rugged centre-back who stood between Banks and the centre-forwards that were to challenge his goal in that memorable tournament. If a ball went past you, Gordon would be in exactly the right position. He was never a big lad, but his positional sense was tremendous. And people would turn, have a shot, and he had narrowed the angle, and most of the shots, he very rarely had to die for them, they would fit him straight in the middle. Perhaps the most famous player that Banks thwarted was Pele. The Brazilian, regarded by many as the best attacker ever, still remembers the day in Mexico in 1970, when his downward header was palmed away by England's number one. I had the ball off the cross of Jaya. I had the ball. I, I already jumped to say go. Then I looked there. I did I did go. Oh. <laughs> I scored more than a, a thousand goals in my life. People don't remember the goal, but the goal I don't score, they remember. <laughs> and that save influenced many off the football field too. Irish author Don Mullen, inspired by Gordon's heroics, wrote a book about his influence in 2006, and it was called A Hero Who Could Fly. Two years later, Mullen gathered legends of the game together to unveil a statue of Gordon. There's no doubt, Banks meant a lot to him. Gordon Banks is a man with an incredibly positive spirit. You know, when you think about some of the lows, you know, in his career, like, the way that Matt Gillies and the board of Leicester City treated him the year after he'd won the World Cup with, with Leicester in 1966, many people would have really gone down after that, and yet Gordon Banks proved that he was the greatest. A modest man, Gordon would never take the credit that others offered, but he did offer this opinion on how he wished to be remembered. When I look back in my life and when I started playing, I didn't know anything of this nature would, would, would be the future for me. The, the, the people of Stoke on tend to be marvellous and, and I, I feel like someone that's lived here all my life now, so it's lovely. Nigel Johnson reflecting on the life of Gordon Banks, who died overnight. Here to talk more about his life is Mike Parry, sports broadcaster from The Two Mikes TV. Uh, sad day, Mike. Oh, terribly sad day. I mean, if you were um, a school kid in 1966, obviously, when he won the World Cup, and then four years later, 1970, the incident we've, uh, you know, we've just been hearing about now, you couldn't fail but to be dazzled by the greatness of Gordon Banks. And if you then you became a, a student of those... Uh, World Cup winning players. Alan Ball was my favourite because my team's Everton, but I looked into the background of all the players. Gordon Banks came from a very humble background, Rotherham, you know, Sheffield, that sort of area, and he wasn't regarded as anything great at schoolboy level. But, and I know I've got Peter Shilton coming on the show, so he knows a lot more about this than I do. Gordon Banks was one of the first goalkeepers who ever decided practice could make perfect. He was weak on crosses when he first started playing football and every afternoon after training at Leicester he would try and find some reserves because they were called reserves in those days, not the youth team and all that and ask these boys to bang balls into the penalty area for him, put him on the penalty spot and he'd go out and try and catch those crosses because he was weak on crosses when he started. He developed his game to become
from a master at crosses, and that largely, I think, is why we lost that 1970 uh, quarter final because the two uh, deciding goals when we turned it up and then Beckenbauer scored, pulled one back 2 1, then we lost 3 2 to two crosses. It was the crosses that did us in, and Gordon Banks was the master of the crosses, much better than people like Lev Yashin or anybody like that. And, and he made himself a great goalkeeper. He trained, and his humility in becoming eminently one of the great footballers of the world and the greatest goalkeeper humbles anybody who met him. Yeah, he didn't He didn't really go for a big career of fame afterwards, really, at all, did he? Well, Gordon Banks was so a footballer, he had nothing else in his life, and so when his career was snatched away from him after the car crash in uh, 1972, there was little more for him to do. He did what a lot of massive achievers in football try to do. I want to stay in the game. He had a very short uh, tenure as a manager at a non-league club, much the same as people like Jeff Hurst and Bobby Charlton did from the same World Cup winning team, but it didn't work out for them. They couldn't translate into other footballers' souls the passion they had for football, the greatness they had, the skill they had and the commitment they had. And when Gordon Banks, and I understand it, having talked to um, people who, who knew him and I've met him at social events, when he decided, I can't make a great contribution to football anymore, and let's face it, he made a huge contribution to football, he said, that's it, I'm taking a back seat, and he walked away from the game. Mm. How important was he in 1966? In 1966, he was vital because England got off to a very slow start. We played Uruguay in the opening game and all our games were at Wembley so there was a huge sense of you know anticipation what was going to happen and what Gordon Banks did was he didn't panic after Uruguay a lot of the, the other players did and, and I've said it'll be okay so then we went through the next two um, qualifiers in the group France and Mexico and we didn't concede and then we played against Argentina now Argentina if anybody's going to score against a European goalkeeper in the World Cup on European soil, it was going to be the animals, as uh, Alf Ramsey called them, from Argentina. Because what they were going to do is, Rattan and his boys were going to get up with their elbows and get them into Gordon Banks' ribs, get their knees into Gordon Banks' back, you know, bring their elbow down onto his head. None of that intimidated Gordon Banks, and he held the line there, and again, we got through without conceding. So then, it was just Eusebio and Portugal between us and the final... Finally, the wall was breached, but it was a penalty from Eusebio. Didn't concede a goal from open play. Wow, you you know your stuff. Can I do that with you on every World Cup since then, or is it? That's amazing. Uh, well, uh, everybody will remember that one because we won that one. But the, yeah. so in seventy, the other one to mention has come up a lot today, Mike, yeah. which is this amazing save yes. from Pele. What was what was the context there? The the well, we heard Pele actually talking about it. It's yeah. very funny when he said everybody remembers me for the goal. Remembers me for the goal. I didn't score. The one thing I do remember talking to Gordon Banks about at a um, do we went to, you know, fundraising do. I think I think it was at uh, it was it was in London, so a hotel in London. He actually said, and and I wanted to ring up a journalist and say, put this in the headlines. And I said, I didn't actually mean to tip it over the bar. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Everybody says he sort of his, scooped it up. Th yeah. That's right. Everybody says his genius was in that. Not only did he switch from near post to far post, get across, put his hand on the ball, but that he flicked it up over the bar. And they interpreted that as being he didn't want the ball to remain in play because. Uh, a Brazilian forward, they were so fast, Jusinho or somebody, would have leapt on it and got it a second time. So they said he deliberately flicked it out. He said he didn't. He said, I was just grateful to get my hand to it and it rolled off the palm of my hand to my fingers and flipped up over the bar. Because <laughs> actually, yes, the movement is so fast, you yes. can't really work out what happened there. Yes. Um, I don't think we're going to get Peter Shilton now, but okay. Um, well, let's I'll but, fill in for you. Well, no, no. I mean, I'm just going to say. Thank <laughs> no, you I'm very only much. joking. I, I, um, love, I love Peter because he he, he truly was. I well, mean, he was his protege, really, wasn't he? Well, well, Peter's very important in the Gordon Banks story, and I'll tell you why. Because of course they were both at Leicester, right? And and it was disgraceful the way he was treated by Leicester. Matt Gillies was the manager, and can you believe a year after winning the World Cup, Matt Gillies had to make a decision between Gordon Banks, World Cup winning goalkeeper, who just reached 30, I think, or the young protege, twenty. 22 year old Peter Shilton. Peter Shilton, and quite rightly, if he's an ambitious footballer, said to Gillies, if you don't play me in the first team, I'm leaving, I'm going elsewhere. Now, Shilton was a great goalkeeper, and Matt Gillies made the decision to take a 22 year old Peter Shilton instead of a 30 year old Gordon Banks. But you know what it was like in those days, Jeremy? You won't believe it. Goalkeepers simply weren't valued. And so when Leicester asked for £50,000 for Gordon Banks, they couldn't get any offers from the big clubs. Oh my goodness. The only person who came in for him from a, what you'd call a big club, and they'd won the league title twice in the 60s, um, Liverpool, right? 
came in, Bill Shankly asked the board at Liverpool for £50,000 for the world's best goalkeeper and they turned him down. <laughs> and the only, the only uh, club that would stump up the money was quite unfashionable Stoke City, who paid 50 grand. He went there and Stoke won their only ever trophy, the League Cup, with Gordon Banks between the posts. Thank you very much indeed, Mike Parry, appreciating Gordon Banks. Mike is sports broadcaster from Two Mikes TV. And, yeah, Peter Shilton got uh, probably distracted on the way, but, um, Peter, if you're listening, thank you for... for trying. Across the bridge where angels fly Across the bridge where angels Across the bridge where 